is Go Beyond. The teaching and preaching ministry with Pastor Michael Eurisha. Michael is an international speaker, songwriter, and the senior pastor of the Judah Ministries International Worship Center, located in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. If you are ever in the greater Pittsburgh area, please come and visit us. Let's now join in with the Judah Ministries praise team at the Worship Center. It's a new season, and it's a new day, a fresh anointing is flowing my way, it's a season of power and prosperity.
So the last two messages, we were in chapters 6 and 7 in the book of Revelation, uh, in the beginning of the apocalypse, and we looked in detail at all four horses. We looked at the white horse and the false religion and the false peace. We looked at the red horse and socialism and communism and how that works into the end days. We looked at the, at the black horse, which is economic collapse that is going to eventually come to the earth. The Bible says in, a, in an hour the economy in the world is going to collapse. And then uh, we see the pale horse, and we discovered that in the Greek, the word pale is chloros, which means what color? Do you remember? It's a green horse. That's a, very good. It's a green horse, and we saw how that ties in with Islam and how um, the Islamic religion ties in to the last days. And once again, you could go on our YouTube or our website, and you could see those messages in their entirety. So chapter 6 is what most believe as the beginning of the seven-year tribulation period or the 70th week spoken about in Daniel chapter 9. Pertaining to this period of time, Jesus said in Matthew 24, if you could put that uh, scripture up, please. Jesus says, in that time there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. So when we read through the book of Revelation, church, this will be the final scene of humanity as we know it. It will be the final chapter of the world as we know it. And I believe, I believe, and I'm not alone in this, that we are right on the doorstep of the coming tribulation period. I believe prior to the tribulation period, I believe that Jesus raptures his church, so he's going to snatch us out of here. And I don't know, that sounds like a good blessed hope to me. How about y'all? So chapter 6 is kind of like the beginning of the end. This morning, we are going to work through the rest of chapter 6 because we didn't finish it last message, and we're going to go all the way through chapter 10. But for the sake of time, we will just read excerpts out of the chapters, and I will make some commentary as we go along. Amen? So your homework assignment for this week... Man, I thought y'all be like, wow, we get homework this week. Thank God, man, I can't wait. Your homework assignment for this week is to read Revelation chapter 6 through 10. Now, listen, listen, listen. I hope, I hope that Sunday morning isn't the only time you open your Bible. I want one amen. Go ahead, Pastor, say that again. I told you I always got my amen corner right in my pocket, y'all, so I'll just go ahead and encourage myself, y'all. So let me say that again. I hope Sunday morning isn't the only time you open your Bible during the week. Yeah, uh -huh. there we go. All right, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we're so thankful for your word. We're thankful for your spirit. We th we're thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, and his death on the cross. Father, we ask this morning that you would open up our spirits, that we would receive your word. Even as your word declares, let those who have ears hear what the Spirit is saying. Father, this morning we're asking you that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is telling us this morning, Father God. Lord, let your word come into our lives and shift us, O oh God. Let it change our hearts and change our minds, Father God, that we might become even more like your Son, Jesus Christ. And for that, we'll be careful to give you all the praise, glory, and honor in the matchless holy name of Jesus and all of Judah said amen. 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 So we're at Revelation chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 9 through 11. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. This is the fifth seal. The first four seals were the first, or the four horses. The fifth seal, beginning in verse 9, says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. Um, so 
after the horses, and this is during the tribulation period, right? That's the time frame we're in right now. Verse 10. They called out in a, lo a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. Now, with this fifth seal, we see those who have been martyred during the tribulation, and they are now in heaven. And the Lord tells them, he says, listen, wait just a little bit longer, not a lot longer, somebody, right? Amen. Not a lot longer, but just a little bit longer. They needed to wait until their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters that were still on earth had to be martyred. Hmm. Oh, that's, that's, that's a tough word, y'all. That's a tough word. Amen. Come on, Judah. What's my two favorite words? But God, listen to me, has a plan for martyrdom. Hallelujah. Oh, my. Hmm, hmm, hmm. All right. Let me break this down a little bit for you. Watch this. In, 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 in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, we preach this word all the time. You have been given power from the Holy Spirit to become my what? Witnesses that you would share the gospel, right? In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. The word witnesses in the Greek there is martus, meaning martyr. Ha. Do you think you have the power of the Holy Ghost just so you can pray to get a new car? Ha. Do you think you have the power of the Holy Ghost just so you can pray and fast and get a new job or more money? Come on, somebody. There's a false doctrine teaching going out there. This name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. I'm telling you, my Bible tells me that I have the power of the Holy Ghost that I can become a martyr for Jesus Christ to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. All right, let me move on, y'all. God has a plan for their martyrdom here in the Bible, just as he has a plan for your trial that you're going through right now. Come on, pastor, keep preaching. Well, I need somebody to help me out here this morning. God has a plan for that trial that you're going through, that tribulation period that you're in right now, that storm season that you're in right now. Honey, God has a plan for your life right in the midst of the storm. Look at Stephen in the book of Acts. The Bible says that they stoned him to death simply because he would not stop preaching Jesus Christ crucified, died, and rose again. They stoned him to death. But listen to me. God had a plan for that martyrdom because sometimes you have to step down so somebody else can step up. Oh my God, I'm preaching now. As Stephen lay there, being stoned to death, he looked up to the heavens and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. You see, while that was going on, there was a Pharisee standing on the sidelines watching this happen, whose name was Saul. We now know him as Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. So while one was being martyred, somebody else was given their life that somebody else might be able to step in. Oh, let me give you another example. Watch this, watch this. Back in the Old Testament, you're familiar with the story of David and Jonathan? Right? David and Jonathan. All right, you have... Saul, who's the king. Jonathan is his son. Jonathan is the rightful heir to the kingship. Are you with me? But yet, this little old shepherd boy comes out of the flock smelling like sheep. Hmm? 
But he takes down a giant. And he saves all of Israel from the Philistines. He takes them down. Then all of a sudden, he goes out and he's victorious. He gets the head of the giant. And then you see, you know, all of Israel. Saul has slain the thousands, but David, the ten thousands. Right there, Saul became jealous of somebody else's gift. Thank God we don't see that in the church today. But watch Jonathan. Jonathan had the rightful place. He was the rightful heir to the throne of Saul because he was his son. But yet he was mature enough. Amen. He had enough kingdom vision. It wasn't about Jonathan vision. It wasn't about where's mine? Amen. How come I didn't get promoted? Come on, somebody. He stood there having enough kingdom-mindedness. He had enough spiritual insight to look at this little shepherd boy and say, listen, I could see God's gifting in you. I could see God's skill set in you. I could see the anointing of God. It's on you. I will step aside that you might be the king of Israel. Come on, somebody. Give God a praise in this house. See, that's true maturity. When we could step aside and say, no, 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 no. You do it. You take it. I see God's anointing on you. I don't have to be the king. Come on, somebody. Amen. He could have taken the attitude, that's my position. I've got the seniority. Who is this new kid in town? He's getting my place, don't you know? I've been faithful day after day after week after week, and this new kid just comes and takes my place. No amens, but that's all right. I'm going to go ahead and just preach anyhow. He could have had all these carnal attitudes, but he didn't. He knew that David was appointed to be king. And even better than that, watch. After David was anointed king, Jonathan served him. Hallelujah. Amen. We need some of that in the church today, somebody. I think we could use some of that maturity. What say you, huh? So the fifth seal is the tipping point. And then God begins to judge. Revelation 6, chapter 12 through, I'm sorry, chapter 6, verses 12 through 17. This is the sixth seal. It says, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned red blood, and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Verse 15. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks and the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? So there are catastrophic physical disturbances in the earth and in the heavens, and men and women from every walk of life will hide in caves and even call on the mountains to fall on them, to take them, and cover them from the wrath of God. At this point, church, the earth finally gets it, that God is God. At this point, they get it. Could this point be the beginning of the battle of Gog of Magog? Because as you read through this, and you read through uh, Ezekiel chapter 38, it's a very similar scenario. But no matter how you read this, at this point, it's a game changer. Could you imagine living on the earth when meteors, asteroids are hitting the planet earth? 
When due to severe earthquakes, mountains and islands are being relocated. Thank God. God, somebody, that Paul wrote that we as the church of Jesus Christ are not appointed to suffer wrath because this is the beginning of the wrath of the, wrath of the Lamb. I don't know about you, but I thank God that God's going to rapture us out of that. Come on, put your hands together if you're with me. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. The sixth seal continues on. Verse 1 says... After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of earth, holding back its four winds. And no wind would blow on the land or the sea or any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east with the seal of the living God. And he called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the seas. Verse 3, do not harm the land or sea or trees until we have sealed the foreheads of the servants of our God. Verse 4, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. So, God sets aside 144,000 Jewish evangelists to carry on the uh, work until Judgment Day. He chooses 12,000 from each tribe, uh, 12,000 from Judah, 12,000 from Reuben, the tribe of Reuben, Benjamin, on and on and on. This is God's continued grace throughout the earth to the human race. The Lord doesn't want anybody to perish. He takes no pleasure in sending anybody to hell. Is anybody with me here this morning? Amen. So he has this entire army of Jewish evangel evangelists that someone would believe, somebody would come to the knowledge and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Now remember, as we read through the book of Revelation, John's vision moves from earth to heaven, earth to heaven, back and forth. It goes from the past to the present, to the future, to the present, to the future, to earth, to heaven. So it's always shifting around. So you have to keep this in mind as you're studying the book of Revelation. And sometimes there are dual applications. When we studied the seven churches a few weeks back in our earlier studies, those seven churches not only applied to the seven local churches that were functioning in that day in Asia Minor, but how many of you know th those letters apply to the church in the 21st century, amen? amen? So we have to read that with in mind. So we need to know how to discern the differences when we're reading the book. So John is recording an earthly event of the destruction, but then he records a heavenly event beginning in verse 9. Verse 9 says, After this I looked up and I saw a multitude too large to count from every nation, huh, every tribe, every people and tongue standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, meaning made pure by the blood of Jesus, and were holding palm branches, signifying our eternal freedom from sin in their hands. Verse 10, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and all the elders and the four living creatures and they fell face down before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength to our God forever and ever and ever. Amen. Come on, Judah. Can we join in and just give our God a praise in this house? So we get a glimpse of what's transpiring in heaven all the while this hell is breaking out on earth. These things are going on simultaneously. It's not like we're watching a football game. Oh, I wonder if we're going to win. I wonder if we're going to fumble. No, 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 no. Our focus while we're in the presence of the Lord, church, is worship. Because at that point, we know the end of the game. We win in a landslide. Come on, somebody. Praise Him. Pastor Michael will be right back with today's message. If you would like to hear or watch other messages by Pastor Michael on your computer or electronic device, or learn more about our ministry, please visit our website at www.judaministries.com. 
www.gobeyond.net and click on Go Beyond. Now let's get back to today's message. Verses 13 through 17, it reads, Then one of the elders addressed me. These in white robes, he asked, Who are they? And where did they come from? Verse 14, Sir, I answered, You know. So he replied, These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed the robes and made them white in blood of the Lamb. For this reason, for this reason, they are before the throne. There's no other reason. It's only this reason, by the blood of the Lamb, somebody. They are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And the one seated on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. Never again will they hunger. Hmm. Never again will they thirst, nor will the sun beat down upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear away from their eyes. So God gives us another glimpse of glory. Jesus, the Lamb, has now become our eternal shepherd in heaven. Amen. He is the good shepherd, and God will wipe every tear away from our eye. Listen, he's going to wipe every heartbreak wiped away, every sickness uh, wiped away, every disease, come on somebody, wiped away. Every ache and pain, and everybody over 50 said amen. amen. They're removed from all eternity. And everybody in this house that's looking forward to that day, come on, somebody say amen. amen. The seventh seal, chapter 8, verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Now, before I move on, I know I've said this to you before, there are those who hold this doctrinal stance that that scripture right there, that silence in heaven for 30 minutes, they make a case that there are no women in heaven. Now, I told you that before. I mean, you know, that's very difficult for women to be quiet for half an hour, right? <laughs> Y'all like to chat it up. <laughs> now that's their doctrinal stance. I don't hold that doctrinal stance. I love godly women and heaven's going to be full of godly women. Come on, put your hands together for the women of God in the house. So there's silence in heaven for just about a half an hour because of the outpouring of God's judgment that heaven is about to witness with the seven angels and the seven trumpets, and the mass destruction that they are going to bring to the earth. All of heaven is speechless. Speechless. Chapters 8 through 10 is a record of mass destruction on earth, almost unfathomable and beyond even our imagination, the degree of devastation. It will be just as Jesus prophesied in the verse we read a little earlier, never before and never after will there be this magnitude of destruction on the earth. Chapter 8 records fire and brimstone burning up the earth. Oceans and rivers are turned bitter. bitter. These global warmers, these climate chambers, uh, changers, and environmentalists on the earth at that time are going to be freaking out, blaming it on your SUV. Blaming it on the coal industry. Blaming it on flatulating cows. Come on, somebody. You know they blame it on that. I'm not even making this up, y'all. I wish I were. But I'm here to tell somebody, listen. Our God, who is in control, he will destroy this earth when he is ready and nobody is going to stop him. Not a new green deal, not a Paris Accord, nobody. Our God is in control. 
Now, I'm not saying, listen to me closely here, that we shouldn't be good stewards of the earth because we should be good stewards of everything that God entrusts to us. Come on, you with me, somebody? But there is a contingency of global warmers and climate changers that have made the earth their God and it has now become their religion. Oh, it's in Scripture, y'all. Romans chapter 1. Although they knew God, they chose not to glorify Him as God, but rather they worshiped the created things. They worshiped the creation. They forgot about the Creator. And if you follow that passage through, the Bible says that eventually He turns them over to stupidity also known as a reprobate mind. Here's a reprobate mind. Watch. Our environment is collapsing because cows are flatulating. <laughs> reprobate mind. Come on, somebody. Amen. Hear me when I tell you we serve a jealous God and he will have no other God before him and he will annihilate everything that tries to set itself up as a God. Come on somebody, praise him in the house. So the cosmos are shaken with asteroids and comets hitting planet earth. And then a third of the sun and the moon and the, the stars are going dark. Then a, an eagle flies out and declares to the inhabitants of the earth that the judgment day has just begun. <laughs> Can you imagine, church, the fear <laughs> in people's hearts at that time? It's recorded in the book of Luke that in those days, men's hearts will fail them simply because of fear. I'm trying to tell somebody that day is coming. Oh, it's not coming, Pastor. Oh, honey, it's coming. And listen, I don't care if anybody doesn't listen. Because here's my model. My model of preaching the gospel is Noah. For upwards, listen to this, watch this. For upwards of 120 Years he faithfully preached God's judgment is coming. 120 years of ministry. When it was all said and done, he had eight members, including himself in his church. Hallelujah. 120 years preaching. It'll never rain. It's never rained before. You're fooling yourself. If you're watching by TV, listen, you're fooling yourself. God's judgment, as sure as I'm standing here, is coming to this earth one day. I'm imploring you to be ready when that day comes. <laughs> Asteroids. Comets hitting the earth. At this time, when all these things are happening, Many will think the, the earth is under attack by aliens from outer space. They'll sell it. And actually, church, it's not too far off, but they won't be aliens. They'll be the angels of God. The fifth angel sounds his trumpet. And then a devil is cast to the earth and he opens hell itself. Demons are released that have been chained in darkness since Satan was cast out of heaven. And they are free to torture men. If you think this world is crazy now. My God. My God. Watch this. Revelation chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. The locust, meaning demons, were not given power to kill them, but only to torment them for five months. And their torment was like the stinging of a scorpion. In those days, watch this, men will seek death and not find it. They will long to die, but death will escape them. The agony 
the torment is so great that people desire suicide. But at this point, it's not possible. Can you imagine the level of despair in people that are living on the planet at that time? Revelation 9, verses 14 through 16. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates and the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day, month, and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard the number. Now, so you don't have to do the math. When you calculate that out, that's 200 million. That's a 200 million man army. You all with me? Say amen. amen. So the sixth trumpet sounds, and four other demons are released from the Euphrates River. Let's have a little geography class here for a minute, okay? I need my first slide up there. This first slide shows you the Euphrates River. It begins in the nation of Turkey, goes down through Syria, Iraq, empties into the Persian Gulf, right through the heart of ancient Babylon, where we took out Saddam Hussein a few years ago, who he actually thought he was Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. All right, so is everybody with that geographic area? You see where the Euphrates River goes? Okay, next slide. This was the latest Islamic caliphate until they were recently decimated, largely in part, by the U.S. military. Do you see the general area? Is everybody with me? Hmm? So you can see, church, listen, there's a whole lot of demonic activity in this region. This is where the prophecy of the book of Revelation will be fulfilled. All right? If you're tracking with me, say amen, somebody. Let me drop a little something here for you. Watch this. In our earlier study of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, we'll put it up on the board. It says this. To the angel of the church of Pergamum. Somebody say Pergamum. Pergamum. Right. These are the words of him, meaning Jesus, who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, the church. I know where the church is, right? The, the pastor, the agalos. That's where Satan has his throne. Yet, you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Are you all tracking with me? All right. Stay with me in my geography class here today. We all know where Satan lives. Where is it? Pergamum. And by the way, listen, Satan is not omnipresent. He can't be in Pergamum and McKeesport at the same time. Uh, he can't be in uh, Moscow and uh, Washington, D.C. at the same time. Come on, somebody with me? Amen. Satan is not omnipresent. So we know his address. We know where his headquarters are located. It's Pergamum. Where's Pergamum, Pastor? Thought you'd never ask. All right, let's put up the next slide, please. Pergamum is located in the western part of Turkey, just on the northern border of Syria, all in the same geographical area where this Bible prophecy is speaking about. And later on in our study, we're going to read about Daniel's vision and how Turkey and all that fit in to this geographic area. So church, listen to me. Listen. That is where we need to keep our prophetic focus. What's going on in Turkey? Turkey. What's going on in Syria? And most of all, what's going on in Israel? Stop Receiving your prophetic words from the nightly news. That's right. Amen. 
You need to stop it. I'm telling you, you Amen. need to stop it. Amen. These propaganda machine in the United States, also known as the mainstream news media, will have you focused on every other nonsensical thing that is doing nothing but dividing this country with lying propaganda. And it's even sad to say that it's dividing the church. But let me tell somebody here something. Here at Judah, huh? we're not united because we're Democrats or Republicans. We're not united because we're red or blue. We're not united because of a donkey or an elephant. We're united by a lion, and that lion is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and his name is Jesus. Come on, somebody, give him a praise in the house. Pastor Michael will be right back with today's message. If you would like to hear or watch other messages by Pastor Michael on your computer or electronic device, or learn more about our ministry, please visit our website at www.judaministries.net and click on Go Beyond. Now let's get back to today's message. Now the Bible states that these demons are kept for this very hour, day, month, and year. Hear me when I tell you somebody, God does keep a calendar. God does keep a calendar and it will be fulfilled in his timing. These four demons will assemble a 200 million man army. And John re-emphasizes the size of the army when he said, I heard the number. He was very specific. Why was John so emphatic? When, you know, John lived, you got to remember this, there weren't even 200 million people on earth. How could there be a 200 million man army? Watch. Of the 1.5 billion Muslims on earth, remember the green horse from the last teaching, it's estimated that 15% of them desire an, uh, an Islamic caliphate with Sharia law at whatever cost. At whatever cost. And make no mistake about it, this ideology is beginning to filter its way into United States Congresses, both at the state and federal yes. levels. You better hear this kind of preaching this morning. Amen. You know, there was, this just happened about a week ago. They asked a, a, a Christian woman to pray at a, a function in our state house. And she got up there. Father God, I thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's by the blood that we're saved. And I thank you for Jesus. And in Jesus' name, we thank you for this country that you founded years ago. And I thank you. And I, I ask you to touch the president and bless him in Jesus' name. And she goes on and on and on and on. Afterwards, they told her she needs to stop saying the name of Jesus. Because there was a Muslim in the audience that was offended. Church, wake up and smell the coffee. So this is what you have happening. 15% of them desire a caliphate with Sharia law. It's been going on for years in other nations. This is called political jihad. It's a part of their plan, political jihad. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are several types of jihad. Jihad simply means a holy, war, a holy war against the infidel. You know who the infidel is? Look at your neighbor and say, honey, you're the infidel. This holy war is against you, my friend. It's against the inf infidel, physical jihad. You see it on the news, the military, uh, ISIS, suicide bombing, etc. You have population jihad when Muslims migrate and overpopulate an area and then they institute Sharia law. This is all over in Great Britain, all over the place, where there are actually no go zones for the police. The police can't even go into these areas any longer. Y'all with me? Somebody please help me say amen. 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 
Now let me make myself very clear. Watch this. Listen. All Muslims are not carrying out jihad. That's right. You got it? That's right. But 15% of 1.5 billion is 225 million Muslims that desire a caliphate. So there's over 200 million right there. We're talking about a 200 million man army that John saw. Right now, China has 600 million men fit for military service. Russia has 50 million. India has 450 million. So listen, church, in 2019, Satan, the Antichrist, these devils will have no issue, no problem getting a 200 million man army. Listen, honey, when this book says 200 million man army, it means it because this word means what it says, says what it means, and every prophetic word will come to pass. Thus saith the Lord God Almighty. Come on and give him a praise in the house. Chapter 9, verses 17 through 18. It says, And thus I saw the horses, the army, in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstones, as the head of the horses were, as the heads of lions. And out of their mouths issued fire, smoke, and brimstone. Watch this right here. Now watch. By these Three, somebody say these three. these three, was a third part of men. That word of the Greek is anthropos, meaning mankind. Third part of men were killed by, here's the three, fire, by the smoke, by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. Listen, church. John wrote this 2,000 years ago, so he had no idea. But this could easily, easily be some type of chemical biological or nuclear weapon launched from tanks or other type of armament. 2,000 years ago, John had no idea. And we know, we know that it's not the blast of the nuclear weapon or the blast of the a chemical bomb that does the most damage. It's the fallout. It's the smoke and the brimstone, if you will. And we know that chem chemical weapons are available in that part of the world and have been used in the past by Saddam Hussein and most re uh, recently by Bashar al-Assad in Syria. We know these things to be true. Chapter 9, verse 18 says this, watch. By these three was the third part of men killed. Now these four devils with 200 million man army, they annihilate one third of anthropos, one third of mankind. Now some commentators interpret this as one third of the entire earth's population, which would mean two billion people. My God. It could also mean though, a third part of the theater of war, which is the Middle East. The population in the Middle East is about 210 million. A third of that would be 70 million people. Either way, church, we're talking massive carnage of humanity. Massive carnage of humanity. World War II, there were 50 to 80 million pe uh, people killed from 1939 to 1945, and a nuclear weapon ended that war. Who's to say that a nuclear weapon won't be used again in this war? I suspect it will be. There will definitely be chemical warfare and nuclear weapons. Now, the most amazing passage to me in this section of Scripture is right here. Chapter 9, verses 20 through 21. Watch this. While all this is going on, it says, and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, by the fallout of chemical weapons, yet repented not of the works of their hands, they, that they should not worship devils, idols of gold, silver and brass and stone and of wood. In other words, they would not let go of their materialism 
which neither can hear nor walk. Neither they repented, watch, of their murders, meaning the martyrs that they killed, nor of their sorceries. Let me help somebody here. That word there in the Greek is pharmacia. Huh? They couldn't let go of their drug usage. Hmm. Nor their fornication. The word in the Greek is pornea. Couldn't let go of their pornography. Nor of their thefts. Even after all this destruction and carnage, possibly two billion people wiped out, men would still not repent and come to the saving grace and the love of Jesus Christ. Amazing. Amazing. Would not repent because their hearts have become so hard. In chapter 10, Prior to the seventh trumpet, John sees an angel standing with one foot on the sea, one foot on the earth, demonstrating that while Satan has a temporary reign over heaven and earth, I'm sorry, over earth, ultimate authority and dominion of the entire world still belongs to our God. John hears a voice like a lion, followed by thunder, and when he is about to write down what he saw, he's told to keep it secret. This thunder often is used to depict God's fury, and it's safe to say that John hears one further judgment, which is too terrifying even to reveal. So how dramatic must that be after what we just read? My God. My God. The same voice tells him to eat the scroll, which is sweet to taste, but bitter to the stomach, signifying that for the believer, while the Lord is reigning over his creation, the return of Jesus Christ will bring destruction and damnation to the world. Next week, we will wrap up chapter 11. But listen, beloved, listen to me. I know that this teaching and this preaching through the book of Revelation is very hard. It's hard teaching. It can be very dark. It could be very fear-filled, if you will. It's not politically correct, which that's not a big deal to us because we don't care about politically correctness, amen? It's cataclysmic. There's death. There's destruction. Demons like locusts. Demons like frogs. Demons like scorpions. Torture going on. The earth is being destroyed by meteors falling from the sky. There's great earthquakes that have never been seen before. There's nuclear chemical fallout. Let me just say it this way. It's not a pretty picture. Come on, somebody, somebody say amen. Listen, this is not your best life now, feel good type of preaching. So one could take this type of preaching and teaching, and you could call it fear-filled. Pastor, you're just trying to scare us out of hell. Well, I hope so. Amen. Let me read the last scripture, and then we're done. Jude, chapter 1, verse 17 through 23. But Judah, but beloved... Remember ye the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ? How that they were told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lust? These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. But you, Judah, you, beloved, building up yourselves on the most holy faith, praying, in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. So having read that, I hope that these messages are scaring the hell out of somebody. If you're with me, would you just put your hands together and give our God a praise?
proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to every nation. To proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romeo.